Well, hi there. I'm Anisha Tank in Singapore for Plant CEO, and I'm really excited about this episode today. We're talking to Vikas Garg, who is the founder and CEO of A Billion Veg. It's a great app. I've downloaded it. So should you. We're going to hear so much about it. Vikas, great to see you. How's it going? Hey, Manisha. It's really nice to be on your show. Thank you so much for having us. So look, um, we're going to talk so much about a bit about your background and how you pivoted into coming up with this app uh, and also a bit about the company. But first of all, I want to ask you how it's been going because we've been in what we call here in Singapore the circuit breaker. In other countries, they call it a lockdown. How's that <laughs> been going for you? It's It's been going. I think we're, you know, we're like like a lot of people, like a lot of companies trying to make the most of it. Uh, I... I, I I thank God that we are not a restaurant or a hotel uh, trying to make it here. Uh, and we have a lot of friends, obviously, in the restaurant and the F&B and the hotel industries who are suffering. And our hearts go out to all of them right now. Uh, we are a digital business. Um, and uh, in many ways, we're here to support that industry. We're also here to support uh, industries and consumers uh, kind of across lots of different kinds of consumer products verticals, including fashion and beauty, uh, in addition to food and packaged food. So what's been really nice to see about our platform is the last three months, we've had our best three months ever. Wow. Um, all in March, April, and May. Um, uh, the team has really come together. It is a strange time, but I'm, I'm really happy to say that we've been having a really great um, yeah, you know, we've been having a really strong run for the last three months. We've been growing our team and uh, we're excited about once things return to normal to start doing a lot of the things that we were hoping uh, to get done earlier in the year. Something interesting about you is it wasn't necessarily necessity, but it was certainly an inner drive that led you to set up a billion veg. Tell us a little bit about back, your background and what a billion veg actually is. So this path to veganism for me started around 2008, 2009. Um, and at first it was even in spite of being somebody, you would think that a vegetarian going vegan is not the biggest thing in the world. Uh, but growing up in New York City, I think you know, when you think about the food pyramid, my entire food pyramid was a slice of pizza. So I went from, you know, being able to enjoy a lot of things that I enjoy on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to, you know, having to cut those things out. And it really felt like a compromise and, and it felt sacrificial. Um, and sometimes you ask yourself, well, why? At some point it became, at some point it went completely in the other direction. It became the most inspiring thing that I ever did for myself and became the most, the single most inspiring thing and, and sort of empowering thing that I did for myself as a human being. And I felt like, wow, this has unlocked a level of mindfulness and consciousness and happiness uh, that I never really, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't, I would have never attributed to this, this action otherwise in my, in my late twenties and then my early thirties, I started to increasingly think about, well, I'm starting to feel ready that I want to start my business. Um, you know, I've been working for other people for a long time. And I just kept on coming back to this idea that the world didn't need another person in finance trying to build another hedge fund or another bank or anything like that. Um, uh, and what a billion veg is, is, is the way that most people think of us is we're an app. Yeah. Uh, it's, a so, it's a social community. Uh, and it's a small and growing and emerging social community and, uh, you know, and, and community of people around the world that are helping each other find great vegan options. Yeah, I want to jump in there because when I first got it and I looked at it, my, my immediate thought was, and I, look, I don't want to compare you to other big apps that are out there, but I felt like, wow, this is like Instagram for vegans. That's how it felt <laughs> to me. I mean, yeah. what do you feel when, sure. I, when I give you that reflection? Yeah, no, great. That's great. It's wonderful. You know, I, I, we're not, we're not trying to copy anyone. Um, but you know, it's like, uh, when you're making a laptop, if you're like, okay, I'm going to make the most innovative laptop in the world, you're not going to completely throw out the keyboard or I guess the iPhone kind of threw out the keyboard. Right. But, um, you're going to start somewhere. And we wanted to start with, we knew that this was a fresh idea that we wanted to build the definitive platform that drove sustainability and made sustainability easier for people around the world and made sustainability easier for, for people and for businesses around the world. 
And it was important that while trying to do something new, a lot of uh, some, some, a couple of my friends have said that it's almost like uh, what, what we are, what a billion veg is, it's almost like if Yelp and Instagram hooked up and had a vegan baby, <laughs> uh, a vegan bastard child, it would be us. And, and I'm, I'm pretty, I'm okay with that analogy. I, I hope that one day you can kind of hold us up side by side and say the two products are comparable because both of those companies have, you know, they, they've accomplished quite a lot and truly have an extraordinary sort of product and user experience. And we only hope that we can, um, you know, we can, we can live up to, uh, to being compared to those things. Well, I'm so glad I haven't committed a faux pas then. Um, but Not let's, at all. <laughs> let's answer the question that might be on the minds of people who are watching this and listening right now. Uh, what exactly is it and how does it work? Yeah, sure. So it's, it's an app that helps you find vegan options at local restaurants, for example. That's one thing that we do really well. Um, if you opened up the app and you clicked on the near me button on the map, or if you were looking for pizza or you were looking for uh, Sichuan food or Japanese food, you know, you can kind of search. Uh, and what it's going to do is it's going to actually show you the vegan dishes at restaurants that are available to you around the world. So growing up in New York, for me, one of the biggest challenges was finding vegetarian food. And then it became finding vegan food. And I was never somebody who wanted to specifically find just a vegetarian restaurant. In fact, back then, going to a vegetarian restaurant basically meant like, cool, I want to go here and I want to get falafel, or I want to go here and I want to get falafel, or I want to go here and I want to get falafel, right? Or some derivative of falafel. And I just was like, the reality is that we want people want to go to great restaurants and they want to have great food and you want to have variety and you want to, you don't want to have to feel like you need to go to a special kind of restaurant just to get, you know, address your dietary need. So um, we're not really focused on restaurant reviews. One thing that we do very differently is dish reviews because most restaurants around the world have maybe one vegetarian option if you're lucky. And most of the time that vegetarian option is not even vegan. You need to veganize it. So what we did is said, you know what, let's level the playing field and let's just help people find vegan options wherever they might exist. So even at a steakhouse or a vegetarian restaurant or anything in between. So that's something that you can expect from the app. Um, you can also expect that if you're looking for information about cruelty-free or non-animal tested products, basically products that are, you know, they could be fashion products, they could be cosmetics, they could be beauty and wellness products. If you're looking to find great products and information and see how people are using them, then you'll be able to find those. And we have roughly about 70,000 product consumer products from around the world that have been reviewed by our community across about 20,000 brands. Something I was really surprised about when I logged on here in Singapore, you know, this is a small nation, yes, but a nation that absolutely loves its chicken rice was the, the, the number of vegan options that there were that I just didn't know about. And yeah, it sure. really opened my eyes. Uh, is sure. that part of the point is that that vegan food industry and not just food, just the vegan industry is really beginning to find its footing. And so, you know, you're giving some more foundation to that. I mean, it's, it's exactly what Plant CEO is trying to do as well. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I would say that I would venture to say that not every company making vegan food would call themselves a vegan company. Uh, or even a vegan food company. Um, I, I would say that there's some companies that are making plant-based burgers that just call themselves the best burger company or great burger companies. And it's just that they're, the material and raw ingredients that they use to make burgers are not, do not come from animals, right? So I think it's, an import, I think it's important to see kind of where the world is going, right? Uh, technolo technology and technological innovation have given us uh, the opportunity to kind of revisit how things arrive on our plate and what they're made out of, right? Um, so you mentioned chicken rice, which is obviously in Singapore is, is, is a very, very, very big thing. Um, the best rated vegan chicken rice dish in Singapore uh, is made by somebody who grew up eating and loving chicken rice, right? And uh, there's now a company in Spain called Hora, and Hora has basically made a plant-based chicken. And it, it, the texture, the meatiness, and the texture, and the, the absorption of flavors that you get typically you would associate with something like chicken 
they've been able to replicate just using plants. And so there are a number of restaurant owners or, in, or business owners in a place like Singapore that have really embraced this kind of innovation. Partly it's to, you know, it's just, it's interesting from a culinary perspective because it's something new. And chefs have not had something new, new mediums to play with for a very, very long time in the kitchen. So that's fun because you can do a lot of different things, right? That are new. B, it's healthier, right? So plant-based meat alternatives do not have any of the cholesterol that you find in, in the animal products, right? The plant-based products, by definition, will not have cholesterol. Um, they also do not contain a lot of the anti an antibiotics, the steroids, the hormones that are injected into animals today because of the way that animals are farmed for food, right? That they need all of those things. So instead of ingesting a bunch of things that you didn't even know was in your food or don't want in your food, now you can eat, you can eat in, a, in a cleaner way uh, while still kind of getting, you know, you're getting your satisfaction from dishes that are very traditional in your diet. Yeah, I have to say one of the most surprising dishes that I discovered here in Singapore was uh, jackfruit, which is a yeah. substitute for pulled pork. I mean, yeah. who oh yeah, <laughs> who would have thought? I I, I had a barbecue. Uh, I had a barbecue uh, last July, um, and my wife and I just bought a ton of jackfruit, and we made pulled pork sandwiches um, for our for our friends at this barbecue. And I had friends the entire night, and look, most of my friends eat meat. Um, and I had friends uh, the entire night that were just like, so we didn't tell anybody. And I had friends the entire night saying, dude, Vikas, I don't know how you do it. Like most like people I know that are vegan would never cook this kind of food for me. It's so nice that you do it, blah, blah, blah. And you know, some of them said that this is the best pulled pork sandwich they've ever had. I mean, jackfruit's a great case in point because I know of companies that have based here in Singapore, that have resurrected the businesses of farmers in Sri Lanka who run jackfruit farms, literally because of the popularity now of this as the pulled pork replacement, as a vegan alternative to uh, something that was always a meat dish before. How important is a billion veg uh, in terms of the sustainability movement? So, you know, first of all, I think that um, in, in terms of the way that, at least from our perspective, um, is that going vegan, being vegan, being more vegan, being more vegan once in a while, or just eating more plant-based food, however you want to define it, um, is one thing that each of us as consumers can do that has a tremendous impact and knock-on effect on the overall environment around us, right? Um, so whether we talk about greenhouse gas emissions or we talk about water pollution or water conservation or plastic, um, we talk about um, we talk about land resource consumption and agriculture and factory farming and the killing of animals, um, or we even just bring it very back to the bring it right back to us, which is we talk about the seven and a half billion people we have around the world, and one billion of those will not have dinner on the table tonight, or will not have a combination of breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Meanwhile, we have a billion obese people. What's going on? We are taking a tremendous amount of resources, right? Food resources and nutritionary resources to feed things like livestock. I'll give you just one example. Three quarters of the world's soy goes to feed livestock. Three wow. quarters. And just in America, one third of America's corn production goes to feed livestock that that's then killed. If you were just to take that, just that corn, the, the corn production in America that's used to feed livestock, you could solve world hunger over and over and over again, right? So with a growing population, right, we have to really think about, do we need more food? Do we need to tie up even more land, which, and, and which causes deforestation and animal agriculture is the single largest source of deforestation globally? Do we need to tie up all of these resources or do we need to just be smarter about the way that we consume resources? So I think that these kinds of brands, these products, and this emergence of new technology, or really it's just in a way, re as you said, you know, giving new life to businesses, uh, I think is really, it's really, really exciting. And we see it happening in a lot of different businesses. So for example, you know, taking uh, in America, for example, 30 to 40% of fruits and vegetables never leave the farm because they're ugly, 
right? And you know, when you go to the grocery store, you need everything to look beautiful and your food can't be marred or funky or anything like that. So historically, a lot of that would just get thrown away or it would get fed to animals, right? Today, you're able to actually mill that. You're able to create flowers from that, proteins from that. And so it's just tremendous to see kind of the whole upcycling movement, right, um, as kind of a natural evolution of the recycling and conservation movement. And what a billion veg's role in is all of this is we think that there's, gonna, there's tremendous opportunity and growth in the entire plant-based sector globally, whether it's looking at food or it's looking at things like consumer products, like food products, beauty products, apparel. We think there's gonna be a lot of transformation. And what we're trying to do is build the digital platform and ecosystem that supports all consumers wherever they are in their journey and supports all businesses wherever they are in their journey, whether you're a 100% plant-based, vegan, cruelty-free business, or you're somebody like Unilever, who, is just, who has really got to think about, well, okay, we want to head in the direction of sustainability, but we're also, we've also got like these hundreds of legacy brands and customers and people that love them. And we can't just, we can't just you know, turn the ship around so quickly. Yeah. Um, on that note, actually, about what we can do to support one another, um, your, you actually do have a connection with the animal kingdom, and it's through the donations that are generated through the use of the app. Perhaps you can explain. Um, so as a small startup, you know, we made a choice to say that we're going to take a big chunk of the funds that we have raised as a business for our business, and we're actually going to start giving it back. We're going to start by creating impact around the world. Um, and we're going to really build that into the user experience. So when somebody and really help people in live a more inspired way by, you know, by nudging them to make their next choice, their next order, something vegan, and then backing that up with a dollar. So what we do is we donate one US dollar uh, every single time somebody uh, orders something vegan, reviews it on our app. Uh, and we do that over and over and over and over again. So we kind of gamify this experience of, of choosing more sustainably. Uh, we have about 60 partners around the world, ranging from some of the world's leading conservation groups like Sea Shepherd, which you know, protects uh, marine life around the world, uh, to mer oh, big consumer, ad big, big advocacy groups like, um, like Mercy for Animals to uh, wildlife conservation groups, uh, for example, Acres here in Singapore. Um, we support China's largest animal sanctuary, uh, and we support, uh, I think, more than two dozen organizations across the United States. Um, in total, about 60 organizations spanning all six continents, with the exception of, Af of, of, of Antarctica. Yeah. Um, so it's really about creating a global movement for compassion, uh, and it's about, you know, just uh, helping people make that connection. And what's been some of the feedback that you've received from these organizations that you've helped? It's been, you know, it's been phenomenal. Um, I, look at, I look at organizations in South Africa. So we support three farm animal sanctuaries in South Africa. Uh, we, we support uh, organizations in Argentina uh, and in Mexico. Um, and we support organizations in places like Colombia and Chile. Um, and of course, I mentioned North America uh, and Europe. Um, and it's been, I'd say that for some of the organizations where, it, especially in a time like this, where a lot of these organizations rely on donations, let's say from people who are coming and visiting, right? Well, we, one of the things that we really look for is community impact. So saving animals is, is wonderful itself but we're really also looking for organizations that are playing an important role in educating their communities um, I mean for instance I still remember the first time that I went to an animal sanctuary in upstate New York because I grew up in New York City um, most of my friends who went on that school trip with me had never seen a chicken or a cow right wow. or a lamb before they're there what chicken was to them was a chicken McNugget right and so it was a very, very powerful thing for them to kind of experience that and hold an animal in their arms or see a cow for the first time, right? And understand like, this is where, this is what your food is made out of. Um, so we think these organizations play an instrumental role. We wanna support them. Um, unfortunately, one of the things that's happened due to COVID 
uh, is many of these organizations can't take visitors anymore for at least for the, they haven't been able to for the last three or four months. So our donations make a huge impact. Well, that's really encouraging that you're able to do what you do. Uh, so I think there are a lot of grateful people for that. Uh, but what it also highlights is you have a very global approach and a billion veg is, it's a global app. It's for everyone, but you're based here in Singapore. Why did you choose Singapore? Uh, I, I didn't choose Singapore. Singapore chose me. Okay. I, uh, I moved here about five and a half years ago and, uh, it was really, um, it was, it was because there was a role that opened up here that I got recruited for, uh, in my prior career, I was, uh, I spent my entire career on wall street, um, investing and trading. And, um, and so I was in California at the time, uh, in beautiful Northern California. And, uh, and I got recruited by, by, um, by, by, by one of sort of the, the bigger sort of industry leaders in the, in the space, in the space that I was in out here in Asia. So it was sort of, it felt like an opportunity of a lifetime. And, uh, and we moved to Singapore back at, uh, back in the beginning of 2015. Um, so my first two years here were really in that business. And then when I decided to launch this company, you know, I just felt like a lot of things like, you know, the reality is that most of the world's young people are in Asia. Uh, if we're going to create change, we can't just keep focusing on the 300 million people or 350, 400 million people that comprise North America, right? And it's really just the U.S., right? So, like, everyone, every, all of the businesses in this particular space, right, and, and more broadly, consumer really focus on North America to start out with. And we felt like, hey, um, Singapore could be a really interesting testing ground for a lot of the things that we want to do. We've never been of the mindset that, hey, uh, let's, we need to think differently because we're here. It's always been like, we have a global audience. What do we need to build? What do we need to do to get there? And so, you know, I mean, it's been interesting to see that like some of our most engaged, most passionate members, users on the platform are sitting in Mexico and sitting in Argentina and Spain. Uh, in Israel, uh, of course, in addition to the U.S. and Canada and the U.K. and 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 then places like South Africa and Singapore and uh, Australia. So it's been it's been encouraging the, the first two years. The first three years building this year has been pretty encouraging. One of the challenges has been talent uh, because all of, for what we are doing, which is very heavy on things like software engineering, the entire market is gobbled up by three or four really top-notch firms. And, and I can tell you that it is very hard to recruit people out of Facebook or Google. The, the, the benefits are extraordinary. You can't compete with Facebook's lunch. It's just too good. <laughs> too good. And Wait, Google too. No. Is it vegan though? That's the question. Oh my God. The vegan food at Facebook <laughs> and Google, are, it's insanely good every single day. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's, and it's been great, you know, because we, we talked to, the funny thing is like the head chef at Facebook's offices in Singapore, um, you know, is, it has become a, an acquaintance and a friend to the company. And, and they've brought us in a couple of times uh, to, to talk during Earth Awareness Week. And I gave a keynote there uh, last year. And I'm just like, it's, 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 it, it, we talk about this, that, you know, there was always been vegetarian food because you've got a lot of the Indian vegetarians, right, that work there. But um, this no, sort of new rise of vegan food has really come about in the last two, three years. And it's been yeah. great to see, um, you know, in, in these cafeterias, these big corporate cafeterias, there's, there's a lot of change happening. So one of the big questions, and, you know, anyone who's watching this right now, who's inspired, who thinks, okay, I want to go and get into this space, let's put some numbers around this framework. What is the vegan food industry worth right now? Uh, that depends. Do you include uh, apples and carrots and... and <laughs> I get you. And bananas. Um, so, you know, I think that, that that's that's the challenge is like most of us eat vegan food every single day. We eat fruits and vegetables and grains um, and rice uh, out here in Asia. 
Um, in fact, uh, someone from Olam, uh, which is one of the world's largest agricultural trading houses, told me that the world's largest source of protein, and if you look at grams of protein consumed globally, is rice. And rice contains very little protein, right? But in terms of just when you add up all of the rice that's consumed, right? So I think it really just depends on how you look at what is the vegan. Animal. Now, I think that your question, you're probably thinking about sort of this new protein, the alternative protein space. You're thinking yeah. about all of the new vegan products, the food products, the packaged food products, like your Beyond Burgers and Impossibles and, and whatnot. Uh, and that industry is growing rapidly. Um, it really started with alternative milks, I'd say almost 15 years ago. Um, and if you look at, you know, if you look at just in the U.S. and you look at just uh, milk that's, uh, that, that's consumed for drink, for beverages, milk beverages, that's approximately about a $20 billion a year market in terms of sales um, of all milk sold to consumers for drinking. Um, because 80, 90% of milk is not actually drank by consumers. It's used in a lot of other products, um, uh, including things like baby formula, right? So um, if you look at just a $20 billion piece of it, you've seen plant-based milk go from basically zero to almost 15% of that uh, in, a pretty, in a pretty short period of time. It's been amazing to see the growth of the plant-based milk space. And today, where you're looking at meat, one of the big challenges has been, is has been cost and availability and scale. But now some of the larger companies in the space are also scaling up. They're actually, in fact, working with the meat producers who've got the large plants to actually build it. And one of the things that you've seen in the US is you've seen meat shortages, right? So during this whole coronavirus, we've seen meat shortages. And so if you're Purdue or you're Tyson, you're going to be thinking about, well, if we were to experience another one of these shortages where, you know, where we simply couldn't kill animals because we were short staffed on labor, how can we produce alternative proteins? So the market is really ripe to grow exponentially. Yep. We've seen just the beginning of that. And it's right now it's, right now it's a market that's a few billion dollars in sales in terms of alternative proteins. Um, but that is that is really slated to grow uh, exponentially over the next 10 and 20 years. So that raises the question, what slice of that do you want to capture with a billion veg? And how do you capture it? How do you make your money? Because I didn't have to pay a penny to get onto your app. When I looked at creating this company, uh, we looked at a lot of different types of businesses uh, including even things like, you know, leather alternatives for shoes and things. And one of the pain points that I saw in that space was there was no lack of entrepreneurship, but it was very challenging to actually market and distribute product to get to any sort of scale where your business became sustainable. So if we can really build up the audience, we then have the opportunity to build a platform and a marketplace that really helps budding entrepreneurs and small businesses around the world connect with each other and connect with consumers and really elevate their brands. And that's really something that I, I'm very passionate about getting so to. Are you making money? We are making some money, yeah. But we are, <laughs> uh, we are spending a lot more money than we are making right now, for sure. But if you are looking forwards, then I'm imagining that that's exactly what you have to do right now. You've also got a pandemic on your doorstep. What would be your advice to people who are not just in the same similar space as you, but people who are in the, the industries that you cover? This is, a, this is an event that I think uh, no, no one expected. Even in December and January, people out here in Asia didn't think that it was going to get as bad as it did. Um, certainly nobody expected it to go from China to, straight to Italy um, and then go jump from there to New York uh, and then everywhere else. And now we're seeing it manifest itself in Latin and South America, which are just sort of entering their winters. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be challenging for a while. Um, we are very, very fortunate to be running a digital platform. But even then, we need businesses to be operating if we're going to ever make money doing this. And, and frankly, if consumers are gonna care enough, right? People need to generally feel stable. 
So, uh, you know, I think that we're all working hard. I think I've seen a few businesses where people have really uh, taken it upon themselves to, you know, figure out how do they help society during this time? Um, how do they reallocate their resources to helping communities, right, that are going through all of this, this, this craziness? And um, I've met with entrepreneurs uh, in California who are, who are repositioning their entire restaurant brands to basically make manufacture food and distribute food to uh, hospital workers or the poor or, you know, sort of the, 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 the people on the fringe who have nothing, you know, and the folks that actually are most susceptible to sort of getting diseases if they're not even able to take care of themselves through basic nutrition. So it's really, I mean, in a sense, it's also really uplifting seeing some of the solutions that are coming out of this. Yeah, it's wonderful to see a lot of compassion coming through as well. Look, finally, I just want to ask you, what's the big dream? Is it, you know, a very fantastic IPO someday? Do you see yourself ringing the opening bell? Uh, do, they, do they still do that? Do they ring the bell? I, I believe <laughs> they do. I believe they do. Well, maybe not um, in a pandemic, they don't. <laughs> um, yeah, certainly not in a pandemic, but... Uh, you know, I don't know. It's, uh, we, we've got a long time before anything like that was to happen. We have a lot that we need to overcome. Uh, for us, uh, for me, um, I really built this platform to serve consumers, to advocate on behalf of consumers. Um, we think that the medium that we have chosen can be a very powerful instrument for change. Um, and our job as a technology platform is to get every single post, every single review back to business owners. That's our goal. Last year, we sent out half a million emails. This year, we'll send out 10 million emails. And we're not, we have nobody sitting there typing out these emails. It all kind of is, in, in a way, built and automated. But every one of those emails is completely unique. Uh, and so when you ask me, what do I really care about? I care that this platform that we're building creates that kind of positive change where we don't, we can walk into any business anywhere in the world. Uh, we can walk into a restaurant uh, in anywhere in Singapore and know that there's great vegan options on the menu. Know that the proprietor has really taken an opportunity to create great vegan options and that we don't have to feel like living sustainably is a compromise or sacrifice. That's simply the most inspired, best way to live. So that's really the goal for the platform. Whatever happens, um, you know, from, a, from the perspective of, 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 of the business, I think that if we fulfill that core promise, I think we're going to have a fantastic business um, that's built around that. And, uh, and, you know, we'll go from there. And just last thing, because anyone who's listening to this, if they're not convinced by now, what were you thinking? How can they get hold of the app? What should they do? Well, you just download, you just download it. So it's everywhere, uh, right? Yeah, you can, um, you can go on the App Store uh, if you have uh, an, an iPhone or a Google Play uh, for Android. And uh, it's just, it's a billion veg. It's all one word uh, with no spaces in between. Uh, and just go ahead and download it. And, uh, you know, it takes two minutes to set up. Uh, and you follow a few people that we recommend near you. And, you know, you kind of get started. Post your first review, just if you've got a photo of, of something you ate at a restaurant recently or something that you just bought that's, you know, that's non-animal tested or cruelty-free and vegan, take, snap a photo of it and, uh, and post a review so other people can see it. And you know, every single time you do that, we'll give you a dollar uh, to donate to some of the most impactful causes around the world so you can feel really good about that 20, 30 seconds of time that you just spent um, that can create real positive transformation and change around the world. It's great stuff. I've done it. I think everyone should do it too. I literally got on the app and just was like, connect, 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 connect with as many people as I could. It was great. It was uh, great. Thank you. And this has been great too. Vikas Gurg, who is the CEO and founder of A Billion Veg. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining us you, today Risha. on Plant CEO. Thanks everyone.